Hi, I'm Dylan. I'm a PhD student at UC Irvine, and I'm going to be talking about our paper, Counterfactual Explanations Can Be Manipulated. And this is joint work with my co-authors, Sophie Hilgard, Hima Lakaraju, and Samir Singh. This work is done between both University of California, Irvine, as well as Harvard University. Machine learning is pretty useful in high stakes settings. And this can range from applications such as finance, um, for instance, loan prediction, to situations like law, to even medicine. In these situations, we're often interested in questions beyond what was the initial prediction on a given instance. In particular, we're often interested in asking the question, how can I get a desired outcome from my model? So to see what this means, and perhaps why it's important, um, for an individual who's denied a loan by a machine learning model, and we're probably interested in asking the question, how can this individual get their loan accepted? What do they need to do such that, according to the model, the loan will be accepted? Now, for certain classes of models, this is probably fairly straightforward to figure out. So if we look at something like a decision tree or a rule list, um, for a given instance, we can parse the decision tree and look at the rule list and figure out what things we need to change to get a certain outcome. This is a bit more difficult for other classes of models, such as deep neural networks. So for an individual who's denied a loan by a neural network, it's quite a bit trickier to figure out um, what you need to change about this instance, um, such that uh, the opposite projection is achieved. Fortunately, um, counterfactual explanations can help us out in this situation. Counterfactual explanations work by solving an optimization problem to get a desired outcome. So let's look at a toy situation where you have a model F uh, to see how counterfactual explanations work. Uh, this model has two classes. There's a granted loan region and a denied loan region. And both these classes are separated by a dotted blue decision boundary. For an individual or an instance represented as X who's denied a loan, counterfactual explanations work by optimizing this objective G. They follow the gradient of this objective to find a point um, with the counterfactual, which we denote as XCF. And ideally, this counterfactual should satisfy a couple criteria. First, it should achieve the desired outcome. So if the individual is denied a loan and they want to get the loan granted, um, the counterfactual explanation in this objective should encourage the recovered counterfactual to be of the desired class. And they also minimize the cost associated with the counterfactual. So this is the difficulty of achieving it. So there's sort of two considerations here being optimized for. And we'll, we'll refer to methods that um, optimize this objective using gradient descent or black box optimization are those that hill climb the counterfactual objective <clears throat> because they effectively follow along the gradient of this objective. And we'll also denote um, A of X um, as running the counterfactual explanation search and um, refer to the particular counterfactual that's outputted um, by optimizing this objective as A of X. Um, so this work is concerned with asking the question of where do these methods fall short? Um, how can bad actors design models that intentionally abuse counterfactual explanations and in this way learn how they might be vulnerable? So the key idea that, um, that this work exploits is that uh, counterfactual explanations and because they follow along the gradient, um, can converge to very different local minimums, just depending on the initialization. So if we look at this example of a neural network trained on a toy data set, if we start at an instance X and we run the counterfactual explanation search by following along the objective G, and we end up at this star, we see that it's quite far away. However, if we just perturb this instance slightly and perturb it to X plus delta, and then we run the counterfactual explanation search, we end up at this much closer point. And interestingly, even though um, we perturbed the instance slightly, for this perturbed instance, we ended up at a much lower cost counterfactual, something that would be easier to achieve. And this is sort of the key vulnerability of counterfactuals that we're going to exploit 
um, and uh, to show how bad actors could potentially abuse them. So um, let's consider a situation where this sort of behavior could be a vulnerability. So let's consider a situation uh, where we have two protected groups in the data. I'm represented as these two columns um, in this graphic on the right-hand side of the figure. Um, so let's imagine a situation where counterfactuals appear sort of similar cost recourse um, for both these groups. So an auditor who's looking at the, both of these groups um, would look at the cost of the recourses and sort of not really figure out that any unfairness is going on. However, let's imagine that the bad actor designs the model in such a way that if they slightly perturb instances, and the counterfactuals returned by counterfactual explanations um, are very low cost. So um, any auditor or person trying to figure out if something nefarious is going on wouldn't see this part. Um, only the, the bad actor model designer knows about this perturbation, which we refer to as delta. So now um, the model designer has effectively built a backdoor into their model. If they take an instance and they apply this slight perturbation a very low cost counterfactual is returned, which means they can unfairly advantage certain groups at their will. So how could a model designer actually go about um, optimizing um, an objective to create a model like this? So first, um, the model designer would want to um, make sure that the fairness is ensured uh, between both these demographic groups. So if we run counterfactual explanations, they produce similar high cost recourse between the demographic groups. Second, um, unfairness is going to be a concern. So under the perturbation delta, um, the model should pr produce uh, low cost recourse. Also, the perturbation should be small, such that uh, there's a minimal chance of being detected um, when instances are slightly perturbed. Um, the counterfactuals should also be ensured such that when the counterfactual explanation search is run on these um, perturbed instances, um, it actually produces counterfactuals. And finally, the accuracy of the model should be ensured such that uh, the model is sort of similarly accurate uh, to training without this objective. So in particular, um, we consider uh, a two-part optimization procedure to satisfy these criteria. So first, um, we ensure that the, the perturbation is small and uh, the model is similarly accurate and under the perturbation, counterfactuals are returned. After optimizing for this initial set of criteria, um, the model weights are passed to the second step of the optimization, as well as this perturbation delta. And this second step um, mostly ensures that uh, uh, fairness on the unperturbed instances is consistent um, the accuracy is also retained, and that uh, the counterfactuals um, under the perturbation are unfair. Now, this objective introduces a number of uh, technical challenges. Um, the most difficult being that uh, we need to pass gradients through the counterfactual explanation search. In particular, we're interested in computing this Jacobian dd theta a of x. And intuitively, this means that if we have a, a counterfactual explanation like this, we're interested in asking the question, what would happen if we change the decision boundary just slightly? So how much would the counterfactual change if we altered the decision boundary? Now, if we had gradient access um, to the counterfactual explanations, this would be quite easy to compute. However, for many implementations and situations, this might not always be the case. Um, so to overcome this, um, we're going to write down a way um, to optimize gradients and compute this Jacobian without actually passing gradients through the counterfactual explanation search. So in particular, we're going to assume that the counterfactual explanation search um, A converges to a stationary point. Um, which is a reasonable assumption, just considering this should be the case um, if the search is successful. Um, and then taking a partial derivative with respect to the model weights theta and applying the chain rule, we end up as such. And finally, we can solve for this term. And effectively, if we do this, this gives us a way to take the pass gradients and compute this Jacobian without actually um, passing gradients directly through the counterfactual explanation search. 
So doing this um, and evaluating how successful the manipulation is, uh, we consider um, evaluation as follows. Um, so we consider a variety of data sets and kind of factual explanations. Um, but for now, I'm just going to pull out um, one particular data set, communities in crime, and one particular kind of factual explanation, DICE. So if we look at uh, the protected and non-protected groups in the data, just divided based on demographic information, and we look at the cost across the groups, we see that they're roughly equal. The non-protected group is, is slightly lower cost, but in general, um, it, looks, it looks pretty close. However, for this manipulated model, um, if we uh, add this perturbation delta and run the counterfactual explanation search, the cost associated with the counterfactuals becomes very small. And this indicates that the, the manipulation is successful. Um, if we look at uh, the success of the manipulation across a variety of different data sets and um, counterfactual explanations, in general, we see uh, that it results in quite a large reduction um, under this perturbation delta. And in particular, we measure the um, uh, ratio associated with the cost reduction on this bottom row of this table. And in general, higher means um, a larger reduction. And in general, we see consistently around two to three times reduction and frequently more. One other question is, are these counterfactuals um, under the manipulated model realistic? So we consider this evaluation based on what we call or the local outlier factor score. So uh, we look at a situation with a Wachter's algorithm applied to communities in crime. Um, and we compare the unmodified model, meaning um, a model trained without the manipulative objective, we look at um, the counterfactuals produced for instances um, on the manipulated model, but without the perturbation. And then we look at instances um, from the manipulated model, but with the perturbation. And with this metric, lower means more in distribution. And in general, what we see actually is that um, the counterfactuals produced um, for the manipulated model plus the perturbation in general are the, the most in distribution according to this metric. And this just goes to show that the counterfactuals returned under the um, under the manipulation um, are quite are quite realistic. And this result holds across uh, different counterfactual explanation methods, um, as well as a variety of different data sets. So one key question with our work is what we can what can we do to prevent the style of attack. Um, we sort of shown so far that it's it's easy to attack counterfactual explanations in this way. However, we really want to figure out ways to prevent the style of attack and make them more robust. Unfortunately, what we figure out is it's not so hard to prevent it. Um, so this graph here shows on the x-axis uh, what we found to be um, sort of more effective at pre prevention, and on the y-axis the invasiveness of the change. So how much do you actually have to change about your modeling procedure in order to get robustness? And in general, what we find um, to be the most effective and least invasive is adding a slight, uh, slight amount of Gaussian noise to the initialization of the counterfactual search. We also found reducing the model size to be highly effective at preventing um, this manipulation, but this is in general a bit more um, invasive and can affect like the accuracy of the models. So if we look at communities in crime and um, uh, Walker's and co-authors algorithm, if we just initialize at um, the original instance X plus a small amount of Gaussian noise, um, and we compare the cost between the protected, um, not protected groups and the not, not protected groups plus this small perturbation, in general, the cost reduction just isn't so large. So in conclusion, what we found is that counterfactuals can be quite unstable and converge to different local minima. And this is a key vulnerability. And bad actors can design models to sort of abuse counterfactual explanations based on this vulnerability. Um, we also, in this work, discovered quite a few fairly straightforward ways to prevent this style of attack, which is quite exciting. 
And in particular, initializing with a small amount of noise in the counterfactual search um, proved to be effective. So thank you. I um, encourage you to check out um, the full paper and happy to answer any questions.